Hi folks, this is Abel James and thanks so much for joining us on Fat Burning Man where we answer your questions and interview thought leaders in health to help you transform your body, mind and life with cutting edge science and common sense wisdom. What do Hugh Jackman, Ryan Reynolds and Scarlett Johansson have in common? Today we're here with Don Saladino one of the most in-demand and respected trainers in Hollywood. Scarlett Johansson, Blake Lively, Hugh Jackman, and David Harbour are just a few of the names of clients he's trained recently. And today he's going to spill the beans about some topics that will definitely raise some eyebrows, including the fact that he gets shredded eating over 500 grams of carbs a day. But before we get to the show, here's the review of the week. Here's one from Brett. He says... Hi, Abel. About two years ago, the TV show you were on came out, and The Wild Diet was the first diet book I ever read cover to cover and followed. I'm male, 5'6", with a starting weight of 321 pounds. In a year, I lost 70 pounds. I feel a thousand times better, and I'm better in every part of my life because of it. I think I was so happy to lose 70 pounds that I forgot about the other 70 pounds I need to lose. When I think about losing another 70, it overwhelms me. Now I'm dialing my diet back in, rereading The Wild Diet again for the fourth time, wow, and drinking a ton of water with a freezer packed full of veggies. I just wanted to reach out because you've been my friend and my biggest support system in all of this. I listened to the podcast, audiobook, and flagged important notes in your book that I reference all the time. I'm lifting weights for the first time in my life. I'm trying so hard to fight those late night binges that made me this way. I sort of hit a low point thinking about how overweight I still am and wanted to talk through it sometime. I hope you get this and thanks for listening. Brett. Brett, congratulations on dropping a whopping 70 pounds in a year. I mean, uh, that's incredible and I'm really glad that you're uh, applying so much of what you've learned on this show and in the book and and seeing results. But uh, keep in mind, 70 pounds in a year, that's a lot. And you've made tremendous progress already. So it's I like to think about, about it kind of like music. Like if, if you're learning to play the guitar, for example, a lot of times when you're learning, you plateau. You get to the, or if you're learning a sport or learning anything really, you get to this point where you feel like you're not getting better. Um, but the, as the months pass, uh, and you feel like you're not getting better, all of a sudden you, you find yourself in this situation where you just like nail something you didn't think was possible before you, you're able to do things that you couldn't do before. And all of a sudden you're at this whole new level of progress. So that can happen with learning that also definitely happens with our bodies. So, um, it's a long journey, and even once you uh, keep in mind lose the the other seventy pounds, uh, you won't be done then either, because then you have to uh, maintain your body as well. So um, don't think that you'll ever arrive and and get to this point where you find the magic bullet and then arrive at, at golden shores where everything is just awesome <laughs> forever. Because uh, in order to succeed. Uh, you kind of need to keep your eye on the ball, play some uh, dietary and nutritional self-defense as well, especially when you're eating out and out there in the real world. Um, but you've learned so much already that if you keep at it, your body will follow you. So the, here are some other things that you might want to try if you feel like you're at a plateau. Uh, you can cut back on fruit and other sugars. If, if those show up in your diet in basically any way, take a look at your drinks, even if it's, uh, you know, like milk, for example, per serving, that can have like 12 grams of sugar, um, which brings me to another point. A lot of times, if you want to get to that next level, cutting out dairy can really help. So watch for uh, sugars, even if it's from fruit or drinks or kind of like hidden sources. Uh, try cutting out dairy for a little bit. And then fat loss in particular is always tied to hormones in your body. So getting plenty of sleep is really important. So if if your stress or your sleep are a little bit out of whack, then you'll have trouble making as much progress. So uh, take a look at those as well. But, you know, having frozen veg in the fridge um, is is great, even more so 
though, I would say that if you're still lifting weights, kudos to you for, for starting that out. If you're still doing that, you're already seeing big results. As we'll get into in this episode with Don, uh, a lot of times you don't see the scale move, but your, your clothes will start to fit differently. Um, that's exactly what happened to David Harbor when he was training for, uh, Hellboy. He was supposed to, he was making progress too fast. So it's, uh, it's really important that you don't get bogged down by what seems like a lack of progress because sometimes it can be happening, but a little bit behind the scenes. Uh, now also in terms of interacting with me, uh, thanks to technology and having internet more often, proper internet for Allison and I. I'll now be doing many more live stream Q&A sessions with folks like you. So uh, if, uh, if you're on Facebook or YouTube or you even just come to my website, there are ways where you can basically type in your question uh, and I'll answer it live. And hopefully, you know, as technology gets better and better, I can do video calls and, and, and talk to people and, and help you all out. But I will be... Uh, on the radar more often and doing more live streams. So if you, if you do want to interact with me and ask your question, uh, please get in touch. You can also always go to fatburningman.com, sign up uh, with your email address, uh, then send me a, a message to abel at fatburningman.com. You can also go to abeljames.com, get in touch there. Uh, and let's see, before we get to the show, one more little quick thing. Uh, some members in our coaching community, the tribe, they struggle with late night snacking and they actually sent in a few things that might help you out. So here are a few pieces of advice. You can always, uh, you know, one thing that, that helps people not eat, especially late at night, is brushing your teeth earlier just because it's so gross to have food after you brush your teeth and it's just kind of this, this cue. So brushing your teeth earlier is a great point as well. That can help you go to bed earlier too. It's kind of a subtle psychological uh, Q. You can also cut cravings. Um, sometimes you're just a little bit dehydrated or maybe you do well with a warm mug of, of herbal tea or bone broth or something like that. Um, sometimes a little piece of dark chocolate, especially like 85% or darker, the, the bitterness in that can cut cravings and obviously chocolate is delicious. And then uh, one thing that I like to, to cut cravings while indulging a little bit in the evenings is sometimes I'll have a cup of... Uh, Generally speaking, full fat Greek yogurt uh, or sheep yogurt with a bit of cinnamon, and I'll put some nuts in there, or maybe some mulberries, some some uh, some fresh strawberries or blueberries or whatever we might have around. And that's kind of like a, a, a it tastes to me. It reminds me of a Sunday, like a kid eating a, a an ice cream sundae. Yeah, obviously, it's not nearly as indulgent, but at the same time, um, you don't feel bad after you eat. It's actually um, quite good nutrition for the most part. Aside from, you know, if you're trying to avoid dairy, obviously that wouldn't work. Although there are some decent, it's very hit or miss, but there are some decent um, coconut yogurts that are pretty good alternatives these days. Especially what I, what I find there is the higher fat uh, the better when you're going for a non-dairy yogurt. There are so many that are just terrible, including coconut ones. And it's like, how'd you screw up coconut? But it's usually because they didn't put the fat from the coconut in there. And that's really what makes coconuts so delicious. But anyway, if you do have more questions and you want more Q&As uh, with me as well as my wife, Allison, and some of our coaches, uh, then please check out the Fat Burning Tribe. That's our coaching community. Uh, you can check that out at fatburningtribe.com. Uh, and you can type it into the browser on your phone, tablet, or laptop, fatburningtribe.com. And we have a special deal going right now where you can try it free for seven days so you get a whole week uh, to see if it it's right for you. We also upgraded all of our websites, which took almost a year, um, to a brand new platform. So our members area has improved speed, security, and mobile usability. Um, with your free week, you can get access to our quick start video library, our meal plans, recipe libraries. And uh, even better than that, there's a new thing that we just started uh, because we launched Wild Superfoods and we've got the Future Greens and all the fun stuff there. Um, if you live in the U.S., 
you actually can get free access to the fat burning tribe when you uh, select subscribe and save on wildsuperfoods.com. So uh, if you get one of our bundles there, if you get some of our health supplements at wildsuperfoods.com, then basically the community of the fat burning tribe and all the coaching there is free as long as you're subscribed. So uh, we're happy to be able to do that and, and try that out for now. So <laughs> we're not sure if we'll be able to do that forever, but we hope so. And uh, so if you do want to get free access to the tribe, make sure that you check out Wild Superfoods at wildsuperfoods.com. All right, on to the show with Don, where we're chatting about how to steer clear of self-proclaimed experts on social media and the web, how A-list celebrities show up in real life, the difference between an expert and a professional, how to use technology as a tool instead of a mind control device, and tons more. Let's go hang out with Don. All right, welcome back, folks. Don Saladino is one of the most in-demand and respected trainers in the business. For over 20 years, he's coached actors, athletes, musicians, and titans of business. Don is also responsible for some of Hollywood's most coveted physiques. Ryan Reynolds, Blake Lively, Hugh Jackman, and David Harbour are just a few names of clients he's trained at Drive 495 Gym in Soho, Manhattan. Don, thank you so much for being here, man. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. So <laughs> there's so many things that we could talk about today, but I'd like to start with uh, this softball question. What's more fun, training good guys or bad guys? Ooh. <laughs> um, I don't even know if I can answer that. That's probably the only question that I've been asked on a podcast that I'm a little tongue-tied on. Um, <laughs> Maybe I it mean, wasn't a softball then. Yeah, it wasn't really a softball. Good guys or bad guys? I mean, good guys. I mean, come on. We all want to see, you know, we all want to see the good guy, you know, come through. Right. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I am. I, oh, man, I can't even talk about this. I do have an actor right now that I'm really close with that's playing. That's going to be playing a villain this next year that cool. I'm going to be I'm going to be rooting for him. But come on, man. We all want to see the good guy come through. Yeah, know? totally. Well, and then there's like uh, David Harbour. He's kind of like the good guy in Stranger Things. And then good slash bad guy in Hellboy. Right. It's, I don't yeah. even know. how. <laughs> I don't even know how to categorize that. But uh, it was it was a fun process getting him ready because we really had to take someone who was living or was being portrayed to live an incredibly unhealthy la lifestyle. Right. And then we had nine weeks to kind of just flip them and get them, uh, you know, get them uh, suit ready, super suit ready. So, yeah, I was, was checking out your blog uh, and, and saw a couple of like the before pictures, which are quite compelling, you know? Um, yeah, but it was what was interesting with him was when we started getting into the process, we we're probably two to three weeks in. He called me up and he's like, you know, the, the production company is like, telling me to slow down they're like uh telling you you know i'm not gonna oh, fit wow. in the suit and we're we're actually making too much progress and i said dave man i you know and, and when i and when i weigh people or you know i i'll still weigh people as gauges it's not something i don't like using the scale right. but i like it for my own records from week to week kind of monitoring what's going on with their weight what's going on with their strength if i see a big drop and a big strength dip then i know there's some red flags going on especially with their energy levels and um I said, Dave, I said, you started this process at 250. You weighed in today at 249. Like we're not, we're not dropping body. We're not dropping body weight where, yeah. you know, we, we lost, maybe it was a half a pound. Not, it wasn't even a pound. He's like, well, I'm not fitting into my suit the right way. I said, like, okay, then I'll make some adjustments, but we we're actually showing too much progress early on. So wow. for his role, it wasn't like he, we, we didn't want him to look like an Abercrombie model. I remember when I sat down with him, when I typically sit down with actors, they'll pull up a picture of, of almost the vision that they have, or the director has on the direction they want to go in. Yeah. So he pulled up a shot putter. It was like a Russian shot putter. Oh, he wow. had to have that, that, you know, like, don't mess with me, you know, thick neck, like beefy Just like look a barrel, that. right? Yeah, exactly. And I think that's what he I think that's what we achieved. I think he did a great job with it. And he's a big dude, isn't he? He's tall. He's probably six four two, yeah, wow. six four two fifty. I mean, he's a big guy. Yeah. And it was funny because when he my main focus with him, and I didn't tell him this, was um getting him resilient, developing hmm. a a level of I don't even know if this is such a word, but it's resiliency a word, but sure. uh 
developing a level of resiliency. So, you know, uh, when, when we went in there, his back was bothering him and, um, you know, I was noticing through, you know, put him through a screening process and, you know, his deadlift early on was really weak. He had, he had a pretty good bench press. He was a big guy. And I just, I kind of told myself, you know, if we can get his deadlift good and he moved, he moved really well for a big guy and we can get his squat good and his core lifts good and strong and develop that level of resiliency, then, um, he's going to be fantastic. And, and that's basically what happened. So I think on week one, he was, he was deadlifting, uh, you know, a, a 24 kilo kettlebell and we were really tentative with his back. And, and on, I, th- I think on the, on, on week nine, he pulled 400 pounds off the floor Jeez. for, it wasn't even that a max. Is a beast. <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't even a max effort pull. It was, yeah. uh, it was, uh, probably, I gotta be honest, maybe at 80, an 80% pull, 85% pull, but why am I going to, why am I going to failure with the, with the, with the, right. jeff, you know, putting him in risk of, you know, there's always risk reward. And my whole thing was just to show him, listen, man, you're going into this role. You're going to shoot this role psychologically. Now you belong in that suit. Yeah. And that's part of what people don't realize when Ryan Reynolds is training for Deadpool. Yeah. He's in a suit, but he's got to get into that suit mm-hmm. with that mental outlook of, I belong in the suit. This is how I look. And that's what makes I, I think that's what makes them so believable as actors. Right. And they're also completely different body types. I'd like to talk about that a little bit or, or at least the results are different. Right. Um, when you come out on the other end, it seems to me and, and uh, you can definitely correct me if I'm wrong, but I've heard that Ryan Reynolds is extremely fierce when it comes to training. And obviously yeah. that shows up on screen later on. Oh, yeah. I mean, what's funny about Ryan, Ryan's like one of the most complete people I've ever met. I mean, he's got this incredible personality. He's incredibly giving. He's he's a, he's a he's a good friend. But when he gets into the gym, it's not all right. We're throwing weights around to have fun. There's mm-hmm. like, what's the objective? What's the game plan? He knows his diet. And with him, he's almost the easiest person for me to train because it's like, all right, uh, done. It's time to go. It, right? Like I, I, and I, I just kind of look at him like, how's how's the diet? He's like, same. I'm like, okay. Like he got on it. He immediately day one. It's like, I know what he's eating at what time, you know, I know what time he's, you you know, having each meal and, 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 and training and everything becomes very monotonous, which I think it's, it's kind of his switch of being able to turn it on. But then in the off season, you know, it's maintenance work and it's mobility and we, and we adjust things to make sure that he's living a healthy lifestyle. What's the Delta? What's the difference between like, um, on screen peak shape and then off season maintenance, as you say? I don't, uh, you know, it's funny. I always, I, I, I kind of coined this phrase. I want you two weeks out. Mm. So and with that, it's almost a, uh, it's almost a bodybuilding terminology, but yeah. bodybuilders will say, you know, I'm six weeks out. I'm four weeks out. That means how many weeks out they are from the stage. Mm-hmm. So what I tell all the, all the actors that I work with is I want you two weeks out of being able to get a phone call from a major publication and be able to get on a cover. OK, so it, it, they never the, the ones that I work with never really slip that far off. They, they're, they're always, you know, two, three weeks out roughly. But for me, my my main focus all the time is energy mm-hmm. and it's movement. And I feel like if I focus on energy and movement, their bodies look great. They're not bodybuilders. They don't have to get on a stage right. and it doesn't matter how much medial delt that they have or, or how much sweep in their thigh they have or how wide their lats are or they're posing. That stuff's irrelevant. If I can get them resilient, mm-hmm. if I can get their energy level optimal and I can make sure that their movement is good and, 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 they're, and they're really strong, everything else takes care of itself through diet. And let's see, we'll always throw a little pump work in there and things to make sure that psychologically they're feeling like, okay, we're doing what we need to do. But yeah. I, 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 I kind of live in this performance physique, um, world where you've got, I always say this, you've got strength coaches that, you know, live in the strength and conditioning world and yep. you've got the, the physique coaches or the bodybuilding coaches and they live so far away from each other. I live right in the middle cause my personal, my own training, you know, I live in those areas. I might go into blocks of training where I'm powerlifting or doing kettlebell training or whatever it might be. And then I might go into what I like to call a deload bodybuilding phase of three to six weeks of like, all right, you know, we're going to run eight by eights on 30 seconds rest, or we're going to do some time under tension, or we're going to really focus on creating tension in that muscle or, or body part split, which I don't run a lot, but I still do. So for me, it's fun for my mm-hmm. clients. It's fun. 
it's fun not living with that one method. You, you know, I, I have a methodology, but not living in that one style of training. And I found that in the long run, your, your, your body and your mind feels pretty good um, from adapting to different types of stimuluses. Yeah, because you're getting so much more action. It's more interesting, right? You know, it's not you avoid the monotony if you are cross training and it's better for your body. You, you avoid kind of overtraining certain pieces and, you know, putting a lot of stress on certain ligaments or part of your body. So it's especially for I would imagine that, you know, someone like Ryan Reynolds is ex- probably extremely experienced at this point in the gym and getting into shape. Whereas like David Harbour was was he like trying to put on weight before that for roles? No. And then, no, no. Okay. I mean, listen, for, he knew for Stranger Things he had to be an out of shape cop. Yeah. So you know, for him it was, uh, you know, it was him just kind of living and, and letting himself go a little bit, <laughs> yeah. which he needed to do. He needed to do it for his role. That's what people don't don't think about. It wasn't right. like oh, he wanted to walk around out of shape, but when he got into shape, I think he realized, wow, there was a feeling that he had that that felt really good. So it was like, all right, how do I feel this way? But almost look like I'm. Um, ready for this role of stranger things. And, yeah. and, and to me, that's what was interesting. And I was happy to see that because we brought him over into a healthier lifestyle, even though his role had to uh, put him into this characteristic, you know, of being, of being out of shape, but, you know, getting back to the stimuluses, you know, when you, when you see power lifters, when you see CrossFitters and they live in this, I don't, I, I, I like all training. I just don't like when someone overstays their welcome. So when you have someone just doing CrossFit all year long. And I'm not talking about the CrossFit games guys because they mm-hmm. train probably more like how, how I train. Yeah. I'm talking about the people going into the group crowd all year long, all year long, all year long. The first three, four months are like, I've never felt this good in my life. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, six, seven, eight months in, they're like, shoulders hurt me a little bit, hips hurt me a little bit. I'm like, all right, man, like, that's your body telling you something like it doesn't like they keep hammering, you know, steel. It, it ain't going to move. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, it, you've got to change your way of thinking and maybe say, all right, you know what? I got to change my style of training a little bit. I think if people did that a little bit more rather than saying this is the be all end all, I think our bodies are going to feel a lot better. So if someone's listening to this and they're, you know, running marathons, triathlons, doing really intense CrossFit or, or what have you, and they're feeling sore, a little bit run down, what would you recommend? How do you handle rest? You, you know, you gotta, you don't have to completely rest, but I, but I think you have to back off or recognize, I'm going to give you a perfect example. Last week it happened to me. I've been in a very heavy training phase for the last, you know, probably six to eight months, maybe even longer. I got ready for the cover of muscle and fitness. I was on the cover in March. That looked um, awesome by the way. <laughs> thank you very, thank you very much. You know, I did that on 300 grams of carbs a day. I didn't did do that. Really? Like, yeah. 275 wow. grams of protein, 300 grams of carbs, 90 grams of fat. And I didn't do that on keto. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was playing ice hockey when I was prepping for it. I, I am, I'm <laughs> an athlete, but just last week I looked at my training partners. I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm feeling it. And they all looked at me and they laughed. They're like, so are we like, we're not recovering the same right now. Like our yeah. bodies are getting sore a little bit longer, not the motivation to train, but the motivation to do specific lifts. So we were like, all right, rather than calling it a deload, Let's get into more work capacity stuff. Let's automatically lighten the weights up for the next three, three to four weeks. We'll work more on work capacity, get some different movements that we haven't gotten in in a while, stay away from some things that we were overstaying our welcome on a little bit yeah. rather than upper lower splits or full body splits or more frequency training. Maybe let's start going to some more body part work. Let's start you know, doing some agility work. And now we started mixing this in. Wow, my body's feeling really good. Like yeah. things are starting to loosen up, but it's not one or two days. It's I give myself a couple of weeks of this to the point where I'm like, all right, man, I can't wait to get back to this other stuff. And then that's when I jump back into it. Yeah. And and the thinking around uh, rest and recovery has really evolved in the past few years as well, hasn't it? it where, you know, especially when I was growing up, it was always rest and ice and uh, thinking – the thinking has, has changed a bit where now it seems like you do want more of that light activity, right? I like it because it speeds up the recovery process. Mm-hmm. What starts happening, I don't mind a week here or maybe you know two weeks max, but I think as we start taking too much time off, you know, I think a lot of times the, the response that I get is that you start feeling too sluggish. Yeah. And remember, there's an effect from training, gets the endorphins up, gets the blood pumping. Make, training makes me feel good. Like I just finished a leg session. I got into a shower. I feel great. Like yeah. my energy level is optimal. My brain clarity is great or good for me at least. And, and, <laughs> and you know, I'm ready to roll for the rest of my day. So me removing that, it, it, it's not good for me mentally. Right. 
physically, yeah, maybe it's my body telling me I need to get away from certain things. But God, like if you're so beat up from traditional powerlifting or weight training, then get on a strict body weight and kettlebell program, you yeah. know, get on the movement, start doing some, you know, light gymnastics work or, or some flow or whatever the hell that you want to call it. But even the cross, the, 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 a lot of CrossFitters come to me and it's normally like, all right, my body doesn't feel good. Like, what do I do? And I'm like, listen, I'm not telling you not to do CrossFit. I'm here to make you more resilient for CrossFit. I will make you better. I will make you stronger for CrossFit. So when we get you back there, you're going to be more of a machine. And they're like, I love it. And then I spend a few weeks or, you know, a month or a couple of months diving them into that training phase and focusing on characteristics that they may not be great at. And then by the time we go back, it's, it's go time, baby. You know, you brought up something that I really like to dig into a little bit, whereas a lot of people would assume probably for, for someone like you, training stars, for, you know, being a trainer for decades, that you just love exercising every single time and you, you want to go really hard and that's just your personality type. But I, what I find is that, you know, especially for, for folks like us, really, is that it's, you're almost running away from not exercising because you feel so bad and kind of trapped inside your own head, trapped inside your own body. I'm speaking for my myself right now but if I don't exercise in too long that's exactly what happens what happens to you you know what same thing I mean I never take a lot of time off I mean I probably take a week off here when I say here and there it might be one to two weeks a year mm -hmm. and I'll normally mix that in if I'm doing like a family trip or we're going to a specific area where I know I'm not gonna have great access to a gym or like we're going to Disney like all right I know the gym I'm gonna be at is gonna be junk I know the food's junk like yeah. I'm just gonna give my head a little bit of clarity and I'm gonna let things just kind of reset a little bit and right. so I, I'll force myself to do that but it's not a lot you know I just feel that you know we can I think it's less about taking on and off it's more about really learning to wave your intensity levels and it's, yeah. it's getting down to like the question of steady state cardio or hit training and mm -hmm. i like to separate cardio training or energy systems or metabolic or whatever you want to call it into three categories i hit training which i think there's a big misconception on what really what hit training really is mm -hmm. medium intensity intervals which is your typical 30 on 30 off one minute on one minute off which most people think that's hit training and it's yeah. and it's not and then steady state cardio which i like to categorize anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes at a heart rate of 120 to 150 mm -hmm. to help get waste out of the body and and and, and what is better the problem with a lot of the science and research that we have out there is that you might find that HIIT training is fractionally better mm -hmm. and it's suddenly everyone's jumping into HIIT training and they're not taking into consideration the nervous system or they're not taking yeah. into consideration how how hard you're, you're training um, with resistance. You know, what are your weight training days like? Or are you a dancer and that's really high intensity? Mm -hmm. Are you traveling a lot? What's your sleep schedule? What's your stress level? So I have people that I'll turn around to and I'll, I'll never have to hit training because it's just too intense. Yeah. So I'll say, wait a second. Whoa, 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 whoa. We've got so many external stressors in your life. Steady state is what we want because that's going to speed the pro the uh, the um, the recovery process up. It's going to get us into a little bit of a fat burning state. It's going to get waste out of the body, mm -hmm. and it's I think it's low intensity enough to where we're going to be waking up the next day not feeling too taxed. And for those of you out there who are listening who have gone high intensity for a couple of days straight, then out of nowhere you're waking up and you're almost feeling hungover mm -hmm. and walking into walls. Could be because your nutrition isn't good enough. You may not have enough carbohydrates to support mm -hmm. what you're actually doing. Your training intensity could be way too high all the time. This is why we have devices out there like heart rate variability or Omega Wave, which yep. a lot of people don't don't use, mm -hmm. uh, which is another conversation. But uh, it's not a one size fits all. I think it really. It, it, I think it's really a simple approach it's listen to your body if you're getting up and your program says that you have to do hit training today and you know you're a dedicated person but you're exhausted don't do hit training <laughs> it's yeah. like okay if you got to get if you got to do some type of, of of cardio because you have a show coming up or you got a movie coming up or you got to look good for the beach either take off mm -hmm. or do some slow steady state cardio where you get your heart rate into those zones or you could speed up the recovery process so i think we got to back off the science a little bit i think we got to use the research as a guide but i think yeah. we have to understand that each of us are individual and um listen moving you know it's better than nothing yeah so you mentioned hit but like that wouldn't really include Tabatas according to your definition. So would you mind expanding on that a little bit? I think HIIT training is – it categorizes as a form of cyclic repeat, a form of cardio where you are able to maintain a maximal level of output 
for that period of time. So Mm -hmm. if you can, if you can max effort sprint for, you know, five, six seconds. And then after that, that intensity or that speed starts diminishing. Well, you're, you're not at optimal intensity. You know what I'm saying? It starts declining. Now, am I going to turn around and say, well, wait a second. I got on a, I got on a, um, I got timed outside on the pavement and I was able to maintain my max speed sprint for five seconds. (coughs) Excuse me. Are you saying eight seconds isn't hit? I'm not going to be that rigid with it and sure. I'm not going to say, all right, but I think you got to fall in those guidelines and those parameters where you're trying to maintain that maximal level of effort. When you're grabbing a set of battle ropes mm-hmm. and you're saying, go as hard as you can, 10 seconds. I literally want you to swing a kettlebell till you feel like your body is going, the body parts are going to detach. I want you to create as much speed and tension as possible. We can't maintain that for 30 seconds. Right. That's so it might feel like our heart rate's getting up, but but it, it's it, to me that's not the highest intensity. So I kind of categorize things a little bit differently, and I say we've got our medium intensity, which is our typical, might be our Tabata, might be our thirty on, thirty off. Um, uh, but the but the hit trade, I mean Tabata's falling pretty pretty close to it, right? I mean, yeah. But Tabata's yeah. twenty on. Tabata's technically considered what twenty on ten off. Yeah. So twenty on ten. But if you think about it, we're not giving enough recovery and enough rest for us to be able to get maximal amount of output. So I would still consider a Tabata yeah. a medium intensity form of cardio. Now, just yeah. because I'm saying medium intensity doesn't mean it's not hard. Right. You know, if it's, I, but it's if, a different kind of hard. It's a different, it's kind, a different kind of, of hard. If I'm getting on a track and I'm maintaining a 150 heart rate for 30 to 40 minutes, 150 might be really high for some people. Yeah. You know what yeah. I'm saying? It might not sound high, but like for some people who are in really good shape, you might be cruising. Like if I'm at 150, I, I could be running at eight, eight and a half miles an hour on a treadmill for 30 minutes. Yeah. That's, that's not easy. Does that make sense? But mm-hmm. that's, so I think there's ways that we need to categorize things and you know, I, I won't be so rigid. We're saying, well, you know, it's, it was six seconds max output. So seven seconds. No, I'm not going to say that, but I think following those parameters and, and understanding what is the goal of hit training? What is the goal of medium training? Yeah. And what is the goal of steady state? I think that's a really important differentiation because I, the way that I like to do uh, Tabata style workouts is I'll usually do that 20 on 10 off with uh, burpees with a push up, And I'll do that for usually like 10 or 11 times in a row. And I am so gassed at the end of it. Um, maybe even by like the fifth or sixth rep, you know, time, time or set time going through those. Um, once I get about halfway, three quarters of the way through, it's much more like a really high intensity cardio workout than it is like, like you were saying, swinging that kettlebell with all of your strength. Because once you're that tired and you've been going for that long, you'll get hurt if you really try to go, you know, 10 out of 10. That's why I like so much about the bell is yeah. that it, it is you can create a form a, a cardiovascular effect, but I'm trying to create tension. That's mm-hmm. why I like hard style kettlebell training rather than sport. I'm not saying sports bad. I'm just saying it's completely different. I, I, I'll call sports style kettlebell training, which is really slow, monotonous, deliberate. Mm-hmm. One of my training partners is like a, is like a considered a sport expert, but I consider that marathon training for kettlebell and I consider hard style more sprinting. Yeah. So that's, so that's, so I believe that we could build a better athlete, a more resilient athlete with sprint training rather than marathon training. Mm-hmm. If someone wants to argue that with having me, done fine. both, I will vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's fine. But I want to build a fast, I want to build, um, an, an intense athlete, someone that could create speed and tension. That's my goal. Mm-hmm. I don't really want to make someone slower. And I also look at physiques, you know, you look at your typical marathon runner, you look at your typical sprinter. Mm-hmm. I want to look like the sprinter. Yeah. So there's more evidence that leads me into, I'm not saying I'm not talking trash about the marathon runner. I'm not talking trash about the sport kettlebell person, but my, my love and my passion and my beliefs will steer me more into that hard style direction. Yeah. I think for a lot of people who haven't tried multiple types of training like that, especially over periods of time, they, they don't know that there is such a big difference between those two things. I, when I was running marathons, um, long time listeners will know this, but I got down to, uh, one, yeah, 148 weight wise. And I was still low body fat, but I was small, the smallest by far I had ever been because I was running, you know, 20, 30 miles, most days. And, uh, I just kind of wanted to see what would happen, but then I did an experiment after that. And the, the months that followed, I started training more for 10 Ks and shorter races. So I stopped all the long running and then just started sprinting. And I put on like 10 pounds 
in a few weeks and uh, got a lot faster, dropped body fat and was eating a bunch more and felt a lot better. You know, it's, it's like I just felt better. I don't think we, and it's very, it, it, I think, I think it's great that you take that approach. I mean, obviously this is what you do for a living. You are a fitness professional, so it's, it's important for you to be able to, to test different waters, but I don't think we, when I say experiment, I don't mean experiment for a week. I mean, truly mm. like I've done the ketogenic diet. I had Ben Pakulski on my podcast yesterday yeah. and we talked about the ketogenic diet and we talked about becoming fat adaptive. And Ben is not someone who doesn't believe in not consuming carbs. Mm -hmm. He loves carbs. He believes the majority of us athletes should be on a higher carb diet. Yeah. But he also believes what I believe that at a specific time during the year, maybe two to four weeks, we should focus ourselves on getting a little bit more fat adapted. Now, yeah. is two to four weeks going to put us into a negative hormonal response? No, it, it's not you know it's gonna trick the body up a little bit it might improve some brain clarity it might get your body to adapt to mm -hmm. to metabolizing fats a little bit better my goal all year long is to get if i could consume 300 grams of carbs i want to then get up to four 450 500 i want to consume more and more i want i want my body to learn to burn that food off i feel like that my recovery is better i feel like that my training is better and at three o'clock in the afternoon i don't feel like i need to take a nap i'm i'm jacked up on on maybe a cup of coffee if that's that's yeah. it a day so um you know but i do recommend to people listen if you're asking a lot of questions if well is intermittent fasting good well what are your goals yeah what are you trying to do if you're a competitive crossfitter i would not recommend intermittent fasting no. you need to be a machine you need to recover you're already putting yourself under an incredible amount of of, of strain mm -hmm. if you do if for a week are you going to feel great probably after two three weeks of it are you going to start feeling not so great, mm -hmm. probably. So, you know, it's just what happens is we jump into these diets and these training methodologies or approaches and you feel so good anytime you try something new. Yeah, at the beginning. And that's in the beginning and you remember that, but then you start, you almost forget that like four months down the road, wow, I don't feel so great about being a vegan now. Like I, right. I, I gave up animal protein four months ago. I felt great, but I don't feel great now. I'm like, so you don't feel great now, but I felt great then. You're right. You felt great then. That was then. This is now. That might be telling you you need to switch things up. So I think we need to listen to our bodies a lot more. Yeah, and it's not a failure if you switch things up. It's listening to your body, like you just said. I think it's important. I think it's important yeah. to understand how your bodies respond. I think it's important to eat seasonally. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to change your training up seasonally. Or people ask me, well, when do you when do you train change your training up? How do you know? I'm like, there's two factors when I train change my training up. When um, your motivation starts dropping, yeah, your energy starts dropping, or when you just when you stop getting stronger. Even if strength isn't the the main focus of it, if you're on a work capacity program and you've done this, maybe CrossFit guys, in the first few weeks, your mm -hmm. time's improving, you're getting stronger, your time's improving, you're getting stronger. Week three, your time's improving, you're getting stronger. Week four, oh, you topped out. Week five, oh, I'm losing time now. Week six, oh, I'm losing reps now. And you start you seeing this decline. Yeah, then you get sick. Then Then the shoulder starts bothering you. Dude, you're done. So yeah. that's that's uh, people don't listen to their bodies. They, they it's like it's like hitting a hammer on a wall. Like it's not going to change. Mm -hmm. Like you you got to like all right, week three you're in, week four it's starting to dip. All right, man, we got all we wanted out of that. It's time to move on. If I want a powerlifting program for four months and I'm having fun with it and I'm continuing to get stronger. I'm going to keep doing that program. Yeah. So I think it, 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 this all depends on so many factors. Are you traveling? Are you fighting with your spouse? How's work going? Are you sleeping at night? Like all these variables can turn around and, and determine yeah. whether one week you're having a phenomenal week of training and you feel like you can conquer the world and you're the incredible Hulk. And then suddenly one day you wake up and you're like, I'm exhausted. I don't feel good. And the next day, and then I don't know where it's this downward spiral mm -hmm. where it's like every day it's just getting worse and worse and worse. All right, man. Look at what's going on here. There's a pattern. We need to switch things up. Yeah, got to change things up. And it seems like there's so much hype about stuff now. I think it's just, you know, technology's changed. There's social media now. Everything's super saturated and just like in your face. But there's so much hype around whatever is new. And I'm using air quotes here because ketogenic dieting has been around for a very long time. Very God. long time. <laughs> I'm, but what a million years probably it's like it's like what the hell? but it's a high uh, low protein it's crazy it's really going nuts again now but not necessarily in the way that say in the let's let's say like the 70s and 80s ketogenic dieting was being used by a lot of bodybuilders uh 
in a cyclic way, right? They call it cyclic ketogenic dieting because like you said, you might go uh, really low carb for a while there, a few weeks as part of a cutting program usually, but then you go back on the carb train and you train a little bit differently. You switch it up because you want your body to be able to handle that. I went from I went from 450 500 grams of carbs a day and I got a call to, I think December 20th and it was you're going to be on the cover of Muscle and Fitness I'm like great how much time do I have and they're like we're shooting January 10th Wow. So I don't even know. I, yeah, I think it was uh, December 20th, December 15th. So yeah. I walk around all year long, two weeks out. My body fat's low all year long. So I knew I could do it. But I, whatever it was, it was a four to five week span yeah. where I said, all right, I'm not dumping my carbs. I'm going to bring them down a little. And I'm going to watch my body from week to week. And I was actually, Dr. Ben House was helping me out a little bit with it. I, I became really friendly with him. And he's like, listen, I was talking about, I just don't want to cut heavy carbs. I just, I'm playing, like I'm working, I'm playing hockey. I'm gonna, I've done this before. I have done a million photo shoots. I don't want to put myself into that. I just, he's like, you don't have to, like you're up at 450, 500, bring it down to 300. Yeah. And I'm like, well, what about fats? Should I drop fats? And he's like, dude, keep them at 90. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I, everything he was saying made sense. Mm-hmm. And I just I just needed to hear from someone else and I did that and like week one it was like I was down like four or five pounds wow and I was like all right I'm losing weight and he's like yeah don't change anything and like every week it was just staying there I'd lose another pound and another pound another pound and I was getting stronger and I think Hmm. I was getting stronger because I was ridding my body of any inflammation that I had in there and my brain clarity improved remember not an alcoholic I'm not a big drinker but not a dessert not a treat not a not a binge food for five weeks which that in itself will take care of so much inflammation people trying to lose weight I'm like your diet looks good but you're just eating like garbage like you're having this monster cheat meal every Sunday and you're having a drink Saturday night which doesn't seem like a lot but it's catching up read that for three weeks and tell me what happens and they're like oh my god I lost 10 pounds I'm like I told you you don't have to make this huge change but I think we have to start recognizing that what we're doing isn't the right thing to do so yeah so I I I mean doing for me carbs are your friend and I, I I just I wish people believed in them a little bit more and you know I, I like that whole line about cyclic keto because it, it is something that these guys used to weigh. But mm-hmm. I think a big problem today, and this is something I could talk to you about for hours. I know we don't have that type of time, but a lot of I'm a coach. Your, you know, your background. You were. Did you? How many years did you coach for? Did you coach for a while? <laughs> I I never was officially uh, officially a personal trainer, but I've been coaching people for. A yeah, for, long but, time. <laughs> but you're, but you're, but you're, but you're a coach. So yeah. I've been a personal trainer and coach. I feel like they're two different things for 20 years. Wow. I've accumulated dozens of certifications. I've taken hundreds of courses. Most of the certifications I never even kept up with because it just didn't even matter anymore. I, I just, now I do continuing education every year mm-hmm. and I've coached different people and I've realized that what works for one person doesn't work for the other. Right. And part of coaching is adapting to that individual. And what's happening now is you get these influencers that get on social media they get a large following and they just turn around and they say well this is what worked for me look i have abs i have great glutes this is what's going to work for you and they start selling a product and they start selling keto as the only diet is being or intermittent fasting because it's something easy to sell Mm -hmm. and it's not a long-term approach you can't work with someone who's an influencer like that work with a coach work with Mm -hmm. someone who's made this their life their life passion and their life. For me, it's my passion to help improve people's lives. I take, I'm speaking in Chicago next weekend. I will sit there and go to lectures and listen to Mike Boyle and listen to other people. And I will learn from these people that I've still been learning from for the last 15, 20 years of my life. Yeah. So it's it just, that's what's frustrating is that you'll have these influencers will paint this picture to people out there that it's not their job to understand that, um, they know what's good or bad in fitness, yeah. And, but they're but but they're watching these people preach and they're taking their advice like it's the be all end all. And it's a lot of times it's the wrong message because mm-hmm. they're always showing themselves in this great light. They're yeah. always showing themselves with their shirt off, their abs, their mood's great. My life is perfect. Like life's not perfect, man. Like uh, I'm waking up in the morning some days at 4 a.m. and I'm getting on the train. I love what I do, but I'm like, damn, it's early, man. <laughs> it's like, 
<laughs> I am tired or man, I'd like to have slept in today or you yeah. know what? I had a bad night's sleep or I'm stressed out because my landlord just bumped my tax bill up $150,000 a year. This is things that you have to deal with in life. And, and I think rather than painting this picture that everything is great, start letting people know it, it, it gets debilitating for people out yeah. there. When you're looking, when someone's sitting there and they're in Ohio and they're like, my life's not so good. And they're watching someone like some woman throw her hair and show her perfect butt and her perfect abs and like her perfect boyfriend. Like, that's not a good message. Yeah, so that's not how it's that's not how it is for a lot of people out there. Well, it's interesting because, like you said, you've been doing this for a long time and Instagram really hasn't had the influence that it's had for more than a couple of years. But but now it's like you because someone has a pretty butt on Instagram, they've got millions of followers and millions of people are listening to their half baked advice, which usually is, you know, sponsored out by some keto company that, that sells some sort of you know garbage because somehow they've convinced people into thinking that like you're keto if you eat a bunch of keto products instead of like if you understand what you're doing at all it was like the gluten-free thing you know you know yes. over the last couple of years like suddenly like oh i'm getting oh it's a gluten-free muffin i'm like a muffin's a muffin a cookie's a cookie yeah i'm glad it doesn't have gluten in it but like that's why you're not, you know, and, and, and lately you, you're starting to see articles come out over the last year of women who are like guys, women who are saying, well, look, I gained 30 pounds on a gluten free diet. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Or I've gained 30 pounds marathon training. Mm -hmm. like, like you didn't do any resistance training. Like you, there's so many benefits to resistance training that you're not gaining. And the stigma of if you lift, you're going to get bigger. It's nonsense. If I wanted to try and get bigger right now, you know how hard that would be for me to put size on? It's not easy. Yeah. It's not an easy thing to do. So. Yeah. You know, one other thing, I was reading an article about you just to prepare for this interview, and I'd like to take out this quote where you say, uh, I'm a professional, not an expert. Yeah. I think that's really important. Would you, would you mind Thank digging you. into that a little bit? Yeah, you know what? Um a lot, a lot of, again, a lot of these influencers are tr trying to coin themselves as fitness experts. And mm -hmm. I, I think the problem is, is that I surround myself with so many people like don't get it wrong. I, I know a lot in this industry. I, I, I take my craft really seriously, yeah. but the people that I surround myself with are people who may have such an expertise in one area. Ch Dr. Charlie Weingroff is one of the one of the smartest human beings in this field that I've ever met. I mean, he he's really, I, I don't even know what to call him. He's he's a physical therapist, but he's got a powerlifting and strength and conditioning background and speaks all over the world. And, you know, you, you sit in a room with that guy for an hour and you can leave there feeling pretty, pretty mm -hmm. stupid and pretty and, and pretty low. So I've put I've made it a point to surround myself with people in areas that I may not be uh, nowhere close to the area that they are. And, and I sit there and I, and I try and learn from them they're still not considering themselves experts. So when you, when you look at people consider me one of the more knowledgeable guys in the world, when it comes down to combining transformation and strength and conditioning business, all this stuff. And, um, God, if, if, if I'm surrounding myself with these people saying, man, I got a lot to learn. How am I an expert? I mm -hmm. feel like when you're, when you're an expert, like you're almost at the end of that. I don't think there's too many experts in the world at what they do. I'm a professional. Mm -hmm. I am incredibly passionate at what I do, but I want to continue to learn and I want to continue to get better. And that's my driving force is that every day I am reading an article. I'm surrounding myself with someone. I'm getting on a podcast with someone like yourself or Ben yesterday. Yeah. And I'm asking, asking questions and I like to listen a lot more than I used to and kind of absorb and take that information. And no, when you're when you're young, you want to talk, 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 it's talk. True. And it's like, dude, shut up, man. You're sitting with one of the best guys in the world <laughs> when it comes down to body training. Ben Pikulski knows more about, you know, body composition and transformation and creating tension than most people do. Sit down and listen to this guy. Charlie Weingroff knows more about physical therapy than everyone I've ever met. And the guy yeah. squatted 800 pounds. Sit down and listen. Ask questions, but listen. Don't tell him what, what you know. Don't try and impress him with what you know. Ask questions. And we don't do that enough. There are a handful of experts in this world, right? And uh, a lot of people are pretty quick to call them. People call me experts an expert sometimes. And I, I really don't like that at all because I think it's important to be a generalist. If you kind of do what we do, which is more coaching people, you need to be able to interface with the real expert, the people who are specialists, right? Expert should kind of mean specialist, I think, in, in whatever I, it is. Like That's a great way to put it. That's um, a great way to put it. But these days, it seems like it's more influence or the amount of followers that you have on a given platform that uh, combined with what you may look like superficially on those platforms. Um, so that that's a real big problem that hopefully we'll, we'll start to grow out of in the next few years, because I, I think it is just kind of a phase 
Um, but it's something that anyone who's listening, you really have to watch out for that these days because it's pretty easy for these people to fake. And now they're being propped up by like companies themselves. Oh, my right? God. But there's no quality control on all, mm-hmm. on all this. You could take an individual who has an incredible physique and you can merge and that guy or woman can have an incredible voice mm-hmm. and you can merge them with the best marketing team on the planet and he's going to become a millionaire now. Yeah. It's just how it is. It's just, it's literally, I feel like it's that simple of a formula. Yeah. You surround yourself with a good enough team that can help you in the areas of marketing um, and business. And if you have that gift to gab and you're able to turn around and sell you, mm-hmm. man, I, I feel like it's, it's pretty easy. And that's why you've seen with timing and you see some of these fitness experts, experts here, here I go, people that <laughs> we consider people that we consider, or I'm sorry, the public considers fitness experts yeah. out there with five, six, seven million followers. And listen, you, you, you can't get mad at them. They're, they're sure. making most of what they have and they're, and they're, and there's a lot to learn from them. I mean, you turn around and you, and you look at a woman like Alexia Clark with 1.3 million people. She grew that pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Go watch what she's doing. Like knock her all you want, say what you want. Oh, 80% of her movements she makes. I don't care. I've heard it all about her, but you know, she's doing something. She's got a consistency. Mm-hmm. She's got a cleanliness of her, of her posts. There's a level of, um, uh, there's this level of like attractiveness that, that, that's going on, sexiness, call it. There's yeah. sexiness when you look at her posts and people are like, oh, wow, that looks cool. I want to try it. And she's growing her brand because of that. So, you know, I think rather than us knocking them, we have to learn from them a little bit. But for mm-hmm. the people out there who are, you know, following or trying to find someone to follow, find a coach, find someone who's, you know, who's, who's, who actually has worked with people for a period of time, find someone who's really passionate at what they do, that the practice is what they, what they preach and find a thought leader, someone who is humble enough to say, I'm still learning yeah. and that I didn't invent this exercise. And you know what? I took this from so-and-so or, you know, I'm sitting down with Ben Pakulski to learn more about his methodology and his approach to creating tension in the muscle. Okay, so that we need to do more of. Yeah, that's a. Are there any other things that that really stand out if someone is following the wrong person, like a, like a fake coach or or coach may, who may not quite be there yet? Um, are there any dead giveaways for you? Well, you know, I think proof's in the pudding. I think, listen, you can follow a terrible coach and get on their program and see good results off of it. Yeah, but I think that, and and that's so. If someone turns to me and goes, "We well, yeah, have that." People are criticizing him as a terrible coach, but. This guy got me off the couch and I lost 15 pounds and I'm moving better than I've ever moved and I love it. I'm going to say, great, then keep doing it. But at a certain point, it's, you know, one size doesn't fit all. It's going to, you're going to start throwing that ball on the wall. It's going to keep bouncing back to you. It's it's not going to work anymore. Maybe some injuries are going on or maybe you feel like you're going in reverse shape. And then at that point, I think it's time to start following someone else. I was, um, you know, I've worked with people before where I've just turned around to them and I said, listen, you should be working with someone else. Yeah. It's not that I, that I can't work with them. It's be, it's that um, they need a certain level of attention that at this point in my career right now, I can't give. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm not getting started. I'm 20 years in. I, I run several businesses. I work with several brands. I've got a digital platform. Mm-hmm. And I got to focus on things that are important to me, like my family. You yeah. know, I can't be sitting here holding one guy's hand every month, uh, every day, because he's like, well, I, you know, I can't eat berries because they don't have them. What about apples? You know, I I like that's So I'll, I'll hand them off to one of my coaches or, or a friend or whatever it might be. So, you know, I think it really just comes down to being mature as a client and saying, listen, this was working in the beginning. It's not working now. I'm going to do some research. I'm going to follow some people and I'm going to find out, are they an influencer Mm -hmm. or are they a coach? Yeah. And I think you can ask that question or you can go do some research or Google them. And, or if you're looking at, you know, um, Jim Smith, I'm making this name up, and you see that he has a great gym in California. He's got a great build, but he's not actually a coach. He's just someone that could lift a ton of weight, and he looks awesome and whatever. Yeah, you know, I don't know. You could you could try doing what they're what he's doing, but it might not work long term. Yeah. Now, man, I can't believe it, but we're already coming up on time. I I want to make sure we talk about this though, because we do live, and it kind of uh, dovetails with the influencer thing. We live in a celebrity or influencer worship culture um yet you work very closely with a lot of these high profile people so would you mind talking just a little bit about what what they're actually like in real life and it doesn't have to be anyone in particular but the real life compared to like on the screen i'll give you first off i mean i've been very blessed i've probably worked with over 50 
celebrities like big screen names it might it might be a lot more than that for what i know but i i currently still hold probably 70 80 percent of the names i probably still work with so i've had a good relationship with these people for close to a, a lot of them close to it or even over a decade yeah um but um god most people don't realize that when they're acting in movies they're acting yeah and i think what what i don't want to say bothers me but what i feel bad about is a lot of these actors got into acting because they had a love and a passion for acting. Yes, they wanted to be successful or, you know, but a, a lot of them just want to be people. They want to go out to dinner. So, you know, when you hear stories about a client going out with his wife and children and people are bothering them for pictures and they're very, they're very gladly obliging and, and, mm -hmm. and taking pictures and signing autographs. It's still to me, it's still an invasion of privacy. And it's still, you know, that time that I feel like we need to respect those people and say, yeah. you know, like Meryl Streep, like I love, like I heard this, um, this Meryl Streep story from one of my clients, from one of my celebs that uh, someone approached her on the street and was said, said, um, oh my God, Meryl, I love you. She said, Thank you. She said, Can I have a picture in your autograph? She goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm not working today. And that, and a lot of people would look at that like it was something that, like, Meryl, just take the picture. No, yeah. not take the picture. Like, you gotta live by these rules and laws. Like, respect this woman's privacy. Like, if she's on set, if she's doing a premiere, if she's, you know, if she's going to a charity function, fine, that's her time to work. But right. respect that she's walking down the street with her kids or whoever it might be. And I think we, a lot of people think that just because what we're seeing in the movie, Sebastian Stan, for instance, mm -hmm. one of my good friends, Sebastian Stan is Sebastian Stan. He's not Bucky. Yeah. You know, I know a lot of people get upset about that, but he, but he, but he's not. He is the guy that I train with, and that, and, and the giving, loving person that likes to give back to others. And he's a great person. He's an incredible human being, but he's not this character that we fall in love with in movies. So I, I think that's what people need to think about. And I think I really wish they would respect more of um, the celebrities uh, time because mm -hmm. they are human beings and they and they do need to live somewhat of a private life. Yeah. And just because they're playing a character doesn't mean that they are that character or even that they like that character. A lot of times they play the unlikable characters because it's more challenging, right? I've had I've had I've had clients of mine. and I can't mention names. I've had clients of mine who've been um, yeah, I don't say casted, but have been. Yeah, I guess in a way casted to play rapists or serial killers and, you know, they've either done it or they've turned down roles because they said, you know, I've got daughters now. Like, I can't right. do this anymore. Like, and I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah, you got to get mentally into that role. And I, mm -hmm. I work with some really talented actors really get into that role. And when you hear them say that, you gain such a respect for them because they take such a um, – such pride in their job and being great at what they do, but they're putting family first. Yeah. And they're trying to set a good example for their children. Yeah. I don't want my daughter to see me raping, you know, six women one day in a movie. Like that's, right. that's terrible. It's a terrible thing. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, um, I, 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 I work with a special group of people. Like I'll, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Well, before we go, I do have one more quick question with the amount of carbs that you said that, that you're eating like up to 500 grams, what's the source? Like, uh, where are you getting those from? Um, sweet potato, a lot of sweet potato. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll do white rice. I still like like a jasmine rice or a basmati rice. And I'll you eat it probably not with much fat on it. No, I actually, well, my, my fat sources, when I was at 450, 500 grams of carbs, I was up at about 125 grams of fat. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I was higher than most people would recommend. I don't, yeah. I, I, I think it takes time now if you're not used to consuming that much carbs and fat and you just suddenly start consuming that you're living a sedentary lifestyle, you're going to get fat. Like, right. But I think it's something <laughs> where, you know, I was talking to one of my, my uh, cousin the other day and he called me up and you know, we have him at about 220 grams of carbs. He's probably consuming a hundred grams a couple of months ago. And he's like, wow, I'm getting leaner. My body's getting fuller. But I want to put on a little bit more size. I'm like, all right, bump it up 25 grams this week. So I had him bump it up from 220 to like 250, 25, 30 grams. Yeah. And I was like, well, how long do I stay with that for? I'm like, let's keep it about a week. Let's see what your body does. Let's see what your weight does. He goes, well, what if it doesn't move? I'm like, I might bump it up another 25 next week. And we start, you know, we got to, you know, want to put size on. We got to put you in a caloric mm -hmm. influx. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't always agree, though, that you know, people are like, you always have to be in a deficit to lose weight. Well, not necessarily. We can, we can, if you're, if you're, if your calories are really clean yeah. and you start eliminating the cheats and the alcohol, that's inflammation. Mm -hmm. So I can keep someone's body, I can keep someone's macros the exact same and, and, and remove inflammatory foods and they'll drop weight. 
Yeah. So that's kind of what I like to go after first. Okay. Because I really don't want to put some, I really don't want to take an athlete or an actor or someone trying to drop a little bit of weight and put them into this deficit or this drastic deficit to where like, wow, I'm looking better, but my energy, man, Don, I'm tired. Like, Mm -hmm. no, man, I want your energy to go up. So my approach might take a little bit longer, but for the long run, it's way better. Because sometimes adding those extra, extra carbs will give a little bit extra energy, a little bit extra motivation to the person to, such that they'll want to work out harder, they'll want to work out more, they'll be in a better mood or what have you and get better results. And what about muscle fullness? Right. What about what that, what that glycogen's doing for you post-workout? Mm-hmm. And listen, I, I, I like manipulating, depending on the individual, I might manipulate their carbs around uh, workout time. I, it's not something where I really, I don't love, unless someone's a, an endurance athlete, I don't really like having someone get heavy carbs in before a workout. Yeah. Because a lot of times I find that that gets them sluggish and slows up brain function. Mm-hmm. So I do believe in like getting a good intro workout, you know, getting a good carbohydrate source during the workout, getting a heavy amount of carbs post-workout and then actually i like in the evening i, I like carbs having in the some carbs. oh i, I yeah. love it I'm, I'm completely against the no carb before bed i feel like it improves yeah, sleep quality like at night <laughs> you wake up a little fuller, a little yeah. more energetic so um there's different approaches that approach doesn't may not work for everyone i mean someone like me i could consume carbs with every meal if i wanted still stay lean all year long yeah so it depends on the person I like them at night, and I've kind of been doing that for a while, mostly because of the sluggishness, the sluggishness thing that you mentioned, where it's like if you if you try it before a big workout, you don't want it to be dragging you down or making you feel heavy. But like feeling heavy and sleepy at night is perfect. <laughs> it like helps me conk out. My ultimate goal before a workout is if I my main goal is if I can go into a workout feeling really energetic, yeah, and getting underneath my weight or my set or my sprint or whatever I'm doing. And feel like I could put maximal output into that and feel strong. That's all I want. Mm -hmm. That is my whole goal with training. If I get that optimal level of energy going into that workout, you know what I'm talking about. You know when you're running and out of nowhere you get that adrenaline burst. Mm -hmm. Or you're lifting and out of nowhere that weight goes up easily. And you get off the set and you literally want to start punching the wall because (laughs) you're – you know what I'm talking about. People listening know it. It's a good day. Imagine having that day in and day out. Mm -hmm. Think about that. I think if, 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 if you can get your energy level at that point, I really think a lot of other things clean up. Totally. Well, uh, before we go, w- would you mind, Don, telling people where they can find you and what you're working on next? Absolutely. Um, you can find me at uh, my Instagram account, Don Saladino, or you can go to my website, donsaladino.com. Uh, got a b- bunch of great projects. I, I, I launched my playbook app over a year ago. Um, this is a way that I can deliver kind of a Netflix model of training you so men and women get their training programs every two months i assign roughly one to two bonus workouts every week i answer every question coming in with myself and my team uh, and, and and just the engagement end of it we're going to start launching contests on there a lot of great cool. stuff uh so and there's a free trial so come some come try that i'm working with a company called garden of life i created the support line an all-organic non-gmo product uh phenomenal product though the whey protein we actually can't say it's organic it's made over in ireland but um it is organic, even though it doesn't have the verif- verification. Um, working with some other companies, Epicured Meal Delivery Service. We just got to Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, phenomenal, low blow food. Um, you know, uh, non-GMO. Uh, we're getting it probably about seventy percent organic now. Other brands like On Running. I'm starting to work with. I'm doing a deal with them right now. This incredible Swiss company that I'm going to be almost um, heading their their X division, which is their cross training. Wow. A lot cross-training sneakers um other small projects that i have going on but uh i I got a cool deal that i can't talk about but i think you're going to see the expansion of our drive name going on we're merging with a pretty big name right now doing some licensing deals so hopefully that works out but won't uh won't put the cart before the horse and just focusing on what i do every day just loving what i do and my family and all good stuff very cool well anyone who's listening out there if you're looking for a real coach who can get you real results please check out Don's work. He knows what he's talking about. He's been doing this for a long time. And uh, man, I, I really appreciate uh, how easy this has been to talk to you and, and how full you are of, of solid information that people really need to hear. So uh, thanks so much for coming by, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Fat Burning Man. If you liked it, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, the podcast app, or wherever else you might be listening to or watching this show. Got a second? 
please leave me a quick review on iTunes. I always love hearing from you. And if you think someone else might like and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or with a family member. You can get in touch with me on Twitter at FatBurnMan and Facebook by typing in Abel James or Fat Burning Man. Drop me a line anytime. Did you know that I've recorded over 150 episodes of Fat Burning Man, winning four awards in independent media and hitting number one in more than eight countries? And here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode for free. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com. I'll give you a second to type it in, fatburningman.com. And you'll get all the show notes in video and audio versions for all the past episodes of Fat Burning Man. Better yet, enter your best email at fatburningman.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll even send you a quick start guide to start burning fat right now and a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now, enter your best email to get your free fat burning download straight to your inbox and make sure that you never miss a show again. This is Abel James signing off. Thanks so much for listening and have a great week.